Welcome back to Finance Uncut. On today's episode, Silver Price Explosion. So I'll put a link in the description to this video and I highly recommend you watch the whole video. Uh, Tavi goes through his uh, macro thesis in regards to precious metals and it pretty much lines up exactly with mine. Um, so I pretty much agree 100% with Tavi on this. But I just want to show a little clip in this video um, and then we'll come back. We'll actually have a look at a thread that Tavi did uh, last week, which even the deflationists who aren't so much gold bugs uh, actually retweeted and said uh, that whatever you think, it's one of the best threads uh, on Fintwit. Oh, it's probably the most interesting chart and, and thesis you can potentially think. I mean, silver fits right in between this monetary disorder, uh, which we're seeing throughout the world, not just in the U.S. It's an important distinction of what a lot of people usually say. Um, but at the same time, there's a there's an issue with a lack of, of exploration in the gold and silver space and silver being a major one here where I think supply is going to start playing a major role in impacting prices. And silver is, for me, the cheapest metal on earth. I've said this maybe a few times and uh, I will continue to buy that because I don't, I don't think it deserves to be sub $30 an ounce today where inflation is, where commodities are. Uh, where the market is in general, I think we're going to see flows of capital coming into the space. And it's a very thin market. So, you know, I would expect to see some explosive move to the upside. Explosive move to the upside for silver. Yeah. Driven by what? Triggered by what? Well, there's a lot of potential triggers. Number one, inflation is, is something that could potentially cause people to start buying silver. Number two, uh, it has to do with the green revolution. Uh, clearly, that's a fiscal part of the agenda, uh, or I think it's fiscal agenda has never been so extensive. There's so many things from peak inequality to green agenda, infrastructure revamp, and so forth. Uh, I think it could be the other trigger has to do with supply. We're seeing issues with finding discoveries of silver uh, in a big way. And, uh, you know, in, in general, capital allocation has completely ignored that as a alternative of investment. And I think uh, that will return. All right, so silver is the most undervalued precious metal, according to you, and you paint a picture as to why it will go higher. A lot of people would argue that it should have already gone higher, and the reason that it hasn't is because the silver market is manipulated, that because silver is critical to so many industries, that there are certain very big players that have a vested interest in suppressing the price of silver, yep. and as industrial demand for silver continues to surge, they anticipate that trend to continue. What do you say to that? I think that the macro reasons to own silver are much larger than, than any anything like that. I mean, can that be possibly happening? Sure. I think that's there is a possibility. Um, it's hard to measure what's what's the impact of that in the silver market. But I think investors that uh, really I mean, there's there's a whole case on the macro side that you can lean on in order to be buying silver today. And it has nothing to do with the, the suppression of the price, it has a lot more to do with the fact that silver is not only cheap relative to other commodities, it's also cheap relative to gold. And 74 is the gold to silver ratio today. The last times we saw that, it wasn't at the peak of the silver market, it was also times that you should be buying the miners. And so um, there's a lot of signs that we are at the beginning of a precious metals cycle, not at the end of one. We haven't seen MNAs, we haven't seen equity issuances, we haven't seen leverage, uh, CapEx is low. So all those signs show, look, we're at the very beginning, the first the early innings of a bull market. And so you want to own silver if you're in that position. Do you have a price forecast for silver in the next year? Uh, everyone tries to get me a price in <laughs> silver. Uh, I, I don't have a specific one. I think we're going to hit, um, once we go to uh, I think there is a, a level at 26, 28 that is very important on a quarterly chart. Mm -hmm. Once we hit that, we're going to go straight to 35 in my roadmap. And that 35, we're going to hit another resistance. And then I think we, we, we're off to, to the races to, uh, to hit new, new highs. Uh, and so that's, that's sort of what I, I, would, uh, I would expect from silver. But what do I know? I mean, I'm, I'm not buying because of those possibilities of the changes in, in the next few months. I'm buying because I think it's the most undervalued thing you could possibly think of.
So I hope you guys enjoyed that. Um, I'm with Tavi. I buy silver because it's the most undervalued asset uh, compared to anything else. And uh, the macro tailwinds are behind it. Uh, I'm not too interested in the manipulation. I'm not too interested in the uh, the charts, as I've said before. I'm not really a chartist yet. I do look at them, um, but I'm a fundamental value investor. And the fundamentals and, you know, obviously it's the most undervalued asset class um, that I can see. And even Jim Rogers, uh, billionaire Jim Rogers, says the same thing. So let's have a look at this uh, thread that, as I mentioned earlier, even the deflationists, uh, you know, Brent Johnson, the uh, dollar milkshake uh, theory guy, even uh, retweeted this and, and, and said, whether you agree with it or not, uh, it is a strong case for gold and silver and gold and silver miners and juniors. So let's have a look at this. The macro case for precious metals. Where are we in the precious metals cycle? There is no shortage of questions on why gold has significantly underperformed during such an ideal macro setting. Let's start by looking at the usual fundamental trends of this industry as part of prior historical cycles. Gold and silver stocks have never peaked at historically undervalued levels. Miners are now trading at the cheapest fundamental multiples we have ever seen. Assuming the current 2022 free cash flow estimate relative to the current enterprise value, median company among the 50 largest miners in the US and Canada exchange now trades at an unprecedented 7% yield, which you can see here in this chart. Note that in aggregate terms, the same basket of companies also trades at its highest free cash flow yield in history, as you can see in this chart. Additionally, as shown in the second panel of the chart below, gold and silver miners continue to expand their margins in a significant way. The median free cash flow margin is now above 25%. Believe it or not, today 73% of the top 50 gold and silver miners are profitable on a free cash flow basis. That is the highest level we have ever seen. Historically, mining companies tend to lever up and dilute massive amount of shares when they're at the top of their cycle. We are experiencing the complete opposite today. These companies have become true free cash flow machines and are now able to not only pay down debt, but to avoid significant equity issuances to finance their businesses. In fact, gold and silver miners just repaid the largest amount of debt in the last 25 years. We have not even seen the onset of an M&A cycle yet. Precious metal miners have turned gun shy when it comes to acquiring new projects or companies. Remember, mining companies tend to overpay for deals at the peak of the cycle. We are barely seeing any deals being done today. It is quite normal for gold to struggle after making new highs. We have seen this price behavior happen twice before, which is quite interesting when we look at that chart. In March 1978, gold briefly reached a record level and then corrected by 15% soon after. Also, January 2008, the metal hit new highs and continued to appreciate for another month until declining by 28% during the GFC. We are probably seeing a similar issue today again. The price is now 14% lower and the entire financial media already claims that gold is dead. Note, however, that... Note, however, how the shiny metal tends to come screaming back after these pullbacks. The gold and, uh, to silver ratio usually reaches historic lows when miners are near peak cycle. Yes, this ratio was high during the COVID crisis, or the cough crisis, shouldn't, shouldn't say that, but the current levels are almost as low as it was during other major bottoms. We think silver is the cheapest metal on earth, and I tend to agree. Here are some technical reasons to be long precious metals. Miners still look very oversold. Last times we had such a divergence between the Philadelphia Gold and Silver Index relative to its 200-day moving average, it also marked two important bottoms. Once again, you know, these kind of charts, they, they look nice. Uh, and I look at these charts, but as T Tavi said in the interview earlier, that's not the reason why I buy it. Silver remains historically undervalued relative to money supply, or I would argue currency supply, 
and is now technically forming a double bottom. Interestingly, as the government has continued to pile on more debt, gold has underperformed. Such a phenomenon is unsustainable in our view. Today, the setup looks just like it did in the early 2000s ahead of 10-year precious metals bull market. Yeah, certainly uh, could argue that. Junior miners in the precious metal industry have started to outperform the seniors. These are important signs that a bottoming is taking place. Ideally, one wants to see the riskier parts of the market not only holding up their values, but perhaps even leading the way to the upside. Yep. The correlation between inverted real interest rates and precious metals is strong and indicates that the industry is due for a jump. Here is silver versus the five-year tips yield. And I've shared this chart in other videos I've done before uh, where you know it's pretty clear that either the uh, you know, five-year uh, tips yield dramatically falls or silver dramatically rises. And uh, I think it's the latter. As inflation continues to develop in the economy, See below the incredible link between gold and CPI since the GFC. Note how after the pandemic lows, gold front ran the potential risk of a rise in consumer prices and the entire precious metals market appreciated sharply. Yeah, we obviously saw that. And um, obviously when you look at this chart, it's not as correlated as some other charts, but uh, nevertheless, uh, that to me looks like, and I've argued this before, that uh, gold should be uh, above its all-time highs in the in the 2000 range. At the moment, obviously, you can use other measurements and other people do for, and argue for higher gold prices. But I I, I think gold's, in my opinion, gold is is worth around uh, valued around twenty twenty four twenty five hundred dollars at the moment. Um, that's my opinion. It is important to remember that before recently peaking gold had been going on a streak for two years already. The metal was up more than 75% from August 2018 to August 2020 and even reached historical highs during this period. And I've shared in videos that I did last year where I spoke about how I had actually started selling some of my stocks in 2018 and rolling into gold and rolling into silver, but more more so in the in the gold market. But then I shared towards the back end of 2019, early 2020, I pretty much stopped buying gold and all I was buying was silver. And then when the market did crash uh, in March, obviously we bought put options on certain individual stocks and made a, a, an absolute killing of a return. But we also backed the truck up on silver and I literally did buy silver at, it, at its um, absolute bottom. Um, maybe, maybe lucky, uh, whatever, I was actually expecting it to go a bit lower. Um, but... Uh, and that's why my silver is up more than 40% um, from where I bought it at. But also gold has done extremely well. Uh, back then, when CPI uh, around 1%, very few investors foresaw inflation as a risk to the economy. Now it is a real problem. We think gold likely appreciated too quick and too fast, becoming what some thought was an obvious trade. Extreme sentiment probably explains the reason for its recent weakness after signaling way earlier than any other asset the possibility that an inflationary environment could be ahead of us. We're now on the other side of this extreme. So, yeah, you look at that chart. Yeah, maybe gold did get ahead of itself. Uh, maybe not. Um, but as you guys know, I am very much on the... Uh, inflationary bandwagon in the years ahead, even though I think we uh, could see bouts of asset price um, issues, let's say. Gold looks fundamentally cheap, technically oversold, while inflation continues to gain traction. See below global central bank assets reaching new highs while gold is still lagging. For us, it's a matter of time until gold follows to the upside. Yep. So that would, uh, on this chart, would, would put gold somewhere around the $3,000 $3, mark. 
We also believe that the historic relationship between precious metals and the growth in CPI will continue to be strong and the recent pullback in gold and silver related assets poses an incredible opportunity for investors to deploy capital at what we believe to be truly attractive levels. Keep in mind that we are using government reported numbers to gauge inflation in this analysis. We should all know by now that the true cost of goods and services is growing at a dramatically or drastically faster pace than CPI. Uh, let's do some comparable analysis now. Precious metals are now at their cheapest levels relative to other commodities since 2009. The other two times this ratio reached such depressed levels also marked incredible buying opportunities. And as I've shared in other videos, I've spoken to some large institutional investors or a large institutional investor who has got a lot of capital sitting on the sidelines and waiting to be deployed. And they are looking at risk off safe haven type assets. And as Tavi said in the interview, silver is such a uh, tight, small market that any decent size uh, institutional investors start to pour capital, even in a small way into this space, uh, it's definitely going to um, to push that price up significantly. Silver has some major catch up to do. Overall, commodities are leading the way and look already or look ready for another big move to the upside after consolidating. Uh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And this is once again, you look at this chart and you're looking at at silver, uh, you know, pushing up towards its all time high. Back to fundamentals. Gold and silver miners have never looked this cheap relative to the S and P 500. Their free cash flow yield is almost twice the overall market. The value and growth proposition embedded in miners today is unmatched by any other time in history. And I agree, and that's why I'm heavily invested in this space, in the mining and exploration space, the precious metals in particular, but also, as you know, uh, other commodities I, I like as well. If gold and silver miners were considered a sector, it would be the only part of the economy today that generates higher free cash flow yield than inflation. And I've shared this chart in uh, other videos. Uh, so, you know, as a fundamental value investor, it just makes sense. And, you know, we've got the macro wins behind us as well. So, you know, this is why I like to buy things that are cheap, undervalued, beaten down, and then just let time do its thing. Again, if precious metals stocks were a sector, they would have the cleanest balance sheets of them all. Consider the fact that the mining industry is also a very capital intensive business. So I've shared some charts in other videos before that just show uh, the debt to assets ratio and just the debt to equity ratio as well and and how gold and silver miners, especially from around 2015-16, when their balance sheets weren't in such a great shape and how they've been able to uh, you know, give credit to where credit's due, the CEOs and managers of a lot of the miners uh, have really, really done well uh, in my opinion, to clean up their balance sheet to where uh, it's argued that they got the best balance sheets in in yeah across all these different sectors. On the supply side, because of a decade of exploration under investment, there have been no major new gold discoveries in the last four years. True. More importantly, the majors have not been replacing their gold reserves and the industry is about to face a supply cliff. Uh, Supply and demand. Miners have been reluctant to spend capital even though gold prices have been moving higher. Thus, supply is constrained. An incredibly bullish fundamental backdrop for gold and silver. Absolutely. And I, I've got to be honest, I actually thought that this would have increased. I guess you can see it has increased a little bit, but I would have um, expected this to increase quite a lot, especially with low interest rates where some big miners maybe could take advantage of that and um, uh, you know maybe maybe put some more more funds or capital into into doing that anyway that and the uh, M&A I think uh, isn't too far away finally a great reminder of asymmetry asymmetry sorry the entire precious metals industry is dirt cheap 
Today's market cap is four times the size of the whole, uh, sorry, Apple's market cap is four times the size of the whole precious metals industry. So yeah, have a look at that. So everyone's pouring into Apple. You know, go have a look at the PEs of Apple and, and its earnings yield and then come back and have a look at the precious metals industry. Uh, and once again, it's all about flows and, and when a lot of this capital that's already sitting on the sidelines, wait until there's more of a sell-off on, on risk on assets and uh, you've got some big players that have got a lot of capital ready to do, ready to be deployed and with the macro headwinds, or sorry, macro tailwinds, I should say, uh, as soon as we start to see some flows into this industry, you know, this is why I'm invested in it. I'm invested before these flows come in. I, I'm invested in it while it's cheap. Uh, and I don't mind if it takes a little bit of time for those flows to come in. When those flows come in, and I've seen it before, I've been in this market before, it has huge runs. And, and I love a good uh, commodities bull market, especially a precious metals bull market, uh, because it's actually a, a, a wild ride. Uh, the problem is you don't want to get in uh, at the end of it or, or after it's, it's had this wild ride, and, and it does move quite quickly. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm keen to get in, get in cheap when it's beaten down. No one wants it. You know, when everyone wants to pile into uh, precious metals, miners, explorers, and, and, and the physical, you know, like I've done with real estate this year. So, you know, while everyone's jumping into real estate, I bought real estate back in 2011, 12, 13, when it was dirt cheap, when no one wanted it, when everyone was selling it. I bought it then. And I've just sat on it for the last decade. And this year, while the market's been going crazy and people are fighting over each other to buy property, I've been like, hmm, you guys can have mine. And I've sold out and redeployed that capital. So inevitably, secular trends and long-term investment thesis are always being tested. It is our job to identify the times when price volatility becomes unwarranted and use it as an opportunity to allocate capital accordingly. We think this is the case today. A deep understanding of the mining industry along with our comprehensive macro and value framework gives us enormous conviction to stick with our strategy and continue to be buyers of these assets at lower prices. To be clear, we did not make a firm wide commitment to partner with arguably the most successful exploration geologist to launch a precious metals fund if we all were aiming if all we were aiming for was a couple of years of strong returns. Gold and silver cycles are long term trends that tend to last many years. Our view is that if there was ever a time to go up on the risk curve in exchange for upside return potential, that time is now. The market is pricing precious metals companies at dirt cheap multiples as if they are going out of business in the next couple of years. In our humble opinion, that could not be further from the truth. And I'll put a link in the description below to this where you can actually go through it uh, in your own time uh, and you can sign up to uh, to get uh, Crescat Capital's uh, research letters. Uh, definitely follow them, uh, follow Tavi on Twitter if you're on Twitter. Um, but yeah, I just had to put this video together because I think Tavi really explains the the fundamentals uh, and the macro thesis for precious metals for gold and silver, and and in particular silver. Um, and and I agree with that. And so if you guys want to know what my thoughts are, how I think about things, how I think about the precious metals industry, well, pretty much how Tavi has summed it up both in that interview and in this thread is exactly how I feel. And and is why, you know, when when you know, everyone's getting upset and, you know, you know, I, I read it in the comments of my videos when people get upset about silver and oh, silver's not going nowhere, or what are we going to wait 100 years until silver, you know, blah, 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 blah. Uh, I really don't care. In fact, guys, if you want to sell your silver, if, if you guys don't like it, you want to sell your silver and gold, send me a message, I'll buy it off you. I, I, I'll buy it off you. Happy to take it off your hands, folks. Anyway, what do you guys think? Love to see your thoughts and opinions in the comments below. 
Uh, don't forget to hit that like button if you did like this video. Really do appreciate it, guys. Uh, apparently, it helps the algorithms uh, from what I'm told. I don't know. Uh, also, if you uh, you know haven't yet subscribed, do so. Hit that notification bell. Uh, share the channel with your friends and family. Uh, we're almost to 10,000 uh, subscribers, which I just can't believe. I can't believe that. Um, you know, I I was pretty stoked when when I had 50 subscribers and you know just had a few few friends and family uh, uh, following this channel and, and and the information that I was putting out. So I'm I'm absolutely chuffed to think that we're we're almost at 10,000 subscribers. So uh, it would be nice now to hit that. So if you can share the channel with your friends and family. Really do appreciate it. Take care, guys, and I'll see you all again on another episode of Finance Uncut.